Also, remember, you have the opportunity to place poinsettias in honor or memory of loved ones. Those inserts are in the bulletin for your use. And then, doing things not necessarily in chronological order, but also on Wednesday, Ladies' Christmas Luncheon. Uh, there's a sign-up for that. You need the RSVP to Rachel to uh, let her know that you're planning to come. The cost of that will be $15, and that's going to be at the Old Florida Chop House just right across the way. This coming. Oh, I'm sorry. The 14th. There it is right there. Thank you very much. December the 14th at 1130. It is a Wednesday. I got that much right. Thank you very much. I'm glad there's smart people in the world that can keep a pastor straight. Also want to continue to mention to you the opportunity. If you own an individual retirement account and are currently taking uh, the required minimum distributions, consider making a donation to charity from that traditional IRA. Uh, that required minimum distribution uh, can be given to the church, and that can be a tax advantage to you. So I want to mention it. Like I said, we're probably going to have to get a new roof on the place, so we're plugging whatever we can. We're celebrating the Lord's Supper today, so as we have been doing, if you have a prayer concern or something that you would like us to pray about, we'll have individuals up here at the front of the sanctuary following the service, and you're welcome to come, and we will be glad to pray with you. Tomorrow, a number of us are going to take over the Prado Theater right up the road here off of Old 41 because there is a motion picture entitled Johnny Cash, The Redemption of an American Icon, based on the book by Pastor Greg Laurie. So if you're interested in that, please show up at the Prado tomorrow at 7 o'clock. A lot of Bay Church will be there. And by the way, any boy here that can prove that your daddy named you Sue, I'll pay for your ticket. And then, remember Christmas Eve coming up on the 24th? Now, we are having worship service on Christmas Day, December 25th. We never considered otherwise. So we will gather here at 10 a.m. on Christmas Day, which is the Lord's Day. But that evening prior on Christmas Eve, we will also have, as has regularly been scheduled through the years, those two Christmas Eve services at 5 and 7 p.m. So wonderful opportunities to worship the Lord as we go through this Christmas season. Again, just pay attention to the schedule. Plug into any of the events and activities that you would like to. I hope I've covered everything that I need to. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, two of our own, Darren and Stacy Robertshaw, to come up and lead us through the lighting of our Advent candle. The second candle on the Advent wreath is called the Bethlehem candle. It is a symbol of the preparations being made to receive and cradle the Christ child. visit of the Magi, Matthew 2, 1 through 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Matthew 2, 9 through 11. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed on coming, in, coming to the house. They saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and incense and of myrrh. And so let us prepare to worship the Lord.
Good morning, church family, on such a glorious morning. We're going to call, join together to do the call to worship. Isaiah 11, on the inside of your bulletin. Read responsibly. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon you, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be the fear of the Lord. Glory to the newborn king. Hark the herald angels sing. Let's stand together and sing also to the glory of his name. We're still new, and I missed you guys. <laughs> I'm glad you're back. Thank you. Well, let us now uh, invite God's presence through our invocation. Will you pray with me? Oh, God, you are wisdom, truth, glory, and the eternal true God and our Lord. You are our hope. And we come now to worship and glorify you who created us in your image. Lord, we direct now our hearts, our minds, and all our thoughts to you. Hear now, O Lord, the adoration of your people. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Lord, teach us how to more and more love your word and hear our prayers, O Lord, 
as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is the reading of the word of God. 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 17. Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore... Thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be a prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make a house, make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure for, forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. We can have our ushers come forward for the offertory. Let's pray. Lord, we come now as part of our worship of you to give not only ourselves, but also what you have given us by your very hand. We ask that you help us to give joyfully from our hearts as we glorify you, the true provider of everything we have. We are thankful, Lord, to have the opportunity and privilege to give back to you now. Bless and multiply these gifts of ours to glorify and grow your kingdom here in Southwest Florida and around the world. For it's in Jesus' name we move, live, have our being, and give our gifts. Amen.
my Savior did come for to die, or to hopeless sinners like you and like I. I wonder. Told Mary her son would be king, that he'd rule forever or everything. But he grew up a teacher of things from above, of peace and of mercy. took him away. They beat him and mocked him on Passover day. He hung on a cross until he was dead. The price of our sins, God placed on His body was sealed in a tomb made of stone, but he rose up to heaven to build us a home, and soon he'll return to those in his care to bring us to heaven. My Savior will be my guide, that he'll grant me courage, compassion, and grace to help build his kingdom while I live this way. Beautiful song, a beautiful rendition, beautiful arrangement. Sometimes um, people come to me and they say, would you accompany with this? But Dan made his own accompaniment up and, and his own arrangement of that, so um, I'm appreciative of that. One of the things that being sort of the director of music around here, I get to pick a lot of the hymns that we do, and a lot of them are my favorites, and this is one of my favorites. Angels, we have heard on high... So we're going to do a lot this season, but would you stand please and let's sing that song.
would invite you at this time to pull out the prayer sheet from your bulletin and take a look down. We mourn with the Klopp family and the loss of Fred, a dear friend, charter member. And uh, Sharon and family are hurting, and so we want to be praying for the Klopp family. Mary Peterson recovering from knee surgery. She had knee surgery on Thursday. We're praying for her recovery. Many more there, many very important uh, requests there. We would invite you to pick out two or three of those for which you pray silently, and uh, I'll conclude us after a time. Let's go to our great God in prayer. Our great God and Heavenly Father, how we are grateful for the privilege of prayer. That you who flung the planets and the stars into the sky. You who has a name for every one of the stars. And you remember it. God, we know that you would then, with great assurance, we hold that you would remember your children, those of us who name the name of Jesus Christ, those of us who have come to humble ourselves, even as Mary, who said, be it unto me, your servant. God, we we come to you on bended knee and say, do to us your servant, even as you have spoken. God, You have given us eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ for those of us who are poor in spirit, who have humbled ourselves and said, God, we need you. Thank you for Jesus who died for our sins. Heavenly Father, we we need a Savior. We need a Savior because we live in a broken world and we ourselves are broken. But we thank you. We thank you that not only have you given us a Savior, but you have, you have placed us in a great land. And you, have, uh, and you have, by your hand, by your word, over the years, God, you have put your fingerprints on this great nation. And we thank you for those men and women who now serve our country to protect our liberties and our freedoms, to allow us to sleep safely at night. And so we give you thanks for those those men and women. We give you thanks for those men and women who are uh, first responders in our community, for those who are uh, physicians and nurses and doctors and researchers who, who provide for our needs. And we thank you for them and pray that you give them, uh, all of them, health and safety and success in their missions. God, we would pray for those with health conditions. We, right now, we want to pray particularly for the Klopp family and the loss of Fred. And uh, God, we pray that you yourself would be a salve and a bomb to their soul as they ache at the passing of Fred who loved you and who was met the moment after he drew his last breath. He was met by you in heaven, and you said to Fred, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your salvation. Thank you for that great assurance that we have that that for each of us, at such time as you call us home, you will greet us with uh, such a greeting, and we give you thanks for that. God, we pray for those who uh, who are ill, who are struggling with health concerns, God, we pray that you would draw near to them, that they might draw near to you. We pray that you'd be an encouragement to their soul. And we pray that by your spirit, you would uh, lead them and give them health and strength. And Heavenly Father, we would pray for the good ministries with which we're associated. We thank you for, for the Cafe of Life locally who helps so many folks 
uh, who are in need. Uh, God, we pray that uh, that, that would be a, a great ministry and that through them the gospel of Christ might go forward. We pray for uh, Robert Knuth and Lucas Tanner, for Jason Francoeur and for Christine McWhite who, who are serving with uh, the college ministry and for Pastor Andre Forge in the place of hope in Haiti. Uh, we know that their need there in Haiti is great. We pray for Pastor Andre that he that you would provide him the resources for him to provide all their needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And now, uh, our God, we would pray that you would move amongst us by your spirit, that you would fall upon our pastor as he preaches, that the words we hear would be your words, that you would prepare our hearts, our minds, our souls to be encouraged and strengthened through your scriptures. Hear us, O God, we make our prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who indeed is our strong Savior. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, so much. And I know that you also will be remembering, as I failed to make a note of it up here, for um, our brother Ron Kick. As you know, Ron lost his wife, Joanne, just back in October on the 18th, I believe. His daughter, Allison, just passed away on the 23rd of November. And in fact, uh, they will be in the midst of a memorial service for her in, in Worcester, Massachusetts, beginning at 11. So please remember Ron. But uh, i tell you what, it's good to see Luke Anderson here. I have heard about the man and the myth and the legend, but uh, wow, so good to see you here. And I know John and Carrie are glad to have you here. I know at least my parents always act happy when I show up. But it's good to see you, sir. Thank you. And then just wanted to emphasize, too, how wonderful it is to be able to serve alongside Dr. Greg Poland, who is our teacher in residence, and you have the opportunity to hear from him. He holds forth in Sunday school class each week, and you can do that right there in the fellowship hall at uh, 10 o'clock currently on, uh, I'm sorry, 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And so we're so grateful for Greg and Jean being among us. And now let's move to God's Word. Luke chapter 1, having mentioned Luke, We'll mention Luke the physician who has good news. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. As we continue along here in this season of Advent, our candles up here so uh, uh, capably lit by the Robert Shaws, and we think about this monumental moment that is the coming of the Lord Jesus when God becomes flesh in order to rescue us. That's why we're here. That's what all of this is about. That's why you've gotten to the, gone to the trouble to come to this place today because we have a glorious Savior. So let's continue along reading in this book as we've been doing Luke chapter 1 beginning with verse 26. Hear the word of God. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom. There will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And may the Lord bless this reading of his word as we give him praise for it. Amen. Everything's in the name. I've been told that occasionally through life. And I remember when Kathy and I were struggling to name our daughter 
because they wouldn't let us leave the hospital with her until we did. We had been able to think of a name for our son when Kathy was still but five or six months pregnant with him as we wanted to name him after the two middle names of our fathers. And Sarah, we had the first name down pat pretty well, but we simply couldn't settle on a middle name. And so we thought, we debated, and we discussed, and we looked over lists of names, and we looked at the meanings of the names, and, and it finally occurred to us as we were looking at those lists that one of my mother's names, Jean, means grace. And one of Kathy's mother's names, Nancy, also means grace. And suddenly it was right there before our eyes. And so Sarah Grace it became, and so she still is. Everything is in the name. Well, as we consider who it is that we worship today, the one true and living God who exists in three persons forever and ever, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have revealed to us today gloriously the second person of the Trinity by the angel. 400 years of relative silence have come to an end. 400 years in which there was no special revelation from God, at least not that which is recorded in Scripture suddenly comes to an end when, first of all, the angel speaks to Zechariah in the temple, as we looked at last week, and now six months later, that same angel named Gabriel goes to a, a backwater place called Nazareth to a woman named Mary, probably a girl, who was a virgin, the most unlikely of people and the most unlikely of places and says, you're going to have a son, and you're going to call him Jesus, a name which means the Lord saves, and the name says it all. Behold, the king is coming. God had promised David centuries before, as we heard read in our scripture reading this morning, that he would have a descendant on the throne forever. It was not possible for any particular descendant of his in the Old Testament sense to fulfill that prophecy. After all, kings come and go, just like leaders in our own time, just like everyone. For as the Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. All of us meet with our demise. There is no one who will be in any position or status forever and ever except the Lord Jesus, who is able to fulfill that prophecy as no one else can because he would, being a descendant of David, but also being God himself, will exist eternally on the reign on the ruling throne of heaven forever and ever and ever. And so we rejoice. Gabriel sent from God because he is a messenger of God. Remember, that's what the word angel means, angelos, messenger. Sent from God for this specific purpose to go to Nazareth to the virgin named Mary. Zechariah had been in Jerusalem, and one would expect that a person picked by God for the purpose of bearing his son, would also be perhaps in that central location, but no Nazareth it is to be. Again, a backwater town, one that is not considered prominent, was not then, is not now. But that's where she was. And to that place, the angel was dispatched. And so we see that Jesus' birth and life are shockingly lowly and humble. This is not the way Hollywood would have scripted it. When you think of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we would think of all the entourage. We would think of all the trappings that normally go with power and prestige. And there are none of those present here. Mary in the humblest of positions. And it is the angel coming to her because God had selected her for this honor. Jesus testified to as much when he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Some people can be intimidating just because of their position and just because of all the appearance of, of personality that may attend them. I've been nervous more than once in front of people. I remember uh, when I was standing face to face with President Ronald Reagan one time, unexpectedly I was standing face to face with him because my roommate who was behind me much taller than me had reached over my shoulder and tapped him on his shoulder and he turned around thinking I had done it and all I was thinking was that the secret service was going to make me the life of the party at any moment and he thrust out his hand and I shook his hand and he looked at me and he said 
in essence, with his face, what do you want? I couldn't think of anything to ask. I could have asked about your meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev. I could have asked, <laughs> what was it like to fly on Air Force One? But the only thing I could think to say was, I saw your movie, King's Row, the other day and thought it was really good. <laughs> and there was my moment. And I blew it. Jesus comes from shockingly lowly accommodations in life, humble, the kind of person that children came to, the kind of person that a woman with an issue of blood dared to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. The Lord Jesus is able to welcome any and all because his circumstances in life are such that anyone can come to him. And we see that right here at the very beginning. We also see very quickly that while his position is certainly one in life that would be considered lowly and humble, his mother's was also, and yet she is blessed with great privilege, which is due entirely to God's mercy and grace. Now, let's understand when the angel calls her the favored one, that has been mistranslated and misunderstood over the years to read that she is full of grace and thus is a source of grace for the rest of us. That's not what this passage means. This passage means that she is a recipient of God's grace, just like us. How is it that Mary would be considered of heavenly citizenship? not because of her own supposed sinless birth, as is held by some, but because she, like any other saved sinner, is an object of God's glorious grace and mercy. And inasmuch, she has found favor. Just like it says in the Bible that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, or favor. She, being that recipient of grace, not a source of grace to us, but yet a wondrous example. For we see in her that resonant humility that is evidence of God's grace. You see, grace and pride can't go together. The Lord, it says, gives grace to the humble. But on the other hand, it says he is opposed to the proud. Be mindful of that. That in our walk with God, we understand it to be a humble walk because we realize that we're the most undeserving of all creatures. The angel's announcement, of course, being one of grace and mercy to Mary, is nevertheless filled with glorious, and I couldn't use the word ubiquity here, Pastor, but I thought specificity might do. <laughs> Every once in a while, I like to just fire one over the bow to let you know that I can, even though I'm from the mountains, I can say a word like specificity. And I even thought about looking it up to see what it means. But I thought, no, I'll, I'll just put it here and let you wonder at my intellectual prowess. No, he gives us a lot of information in a short period of time, doesn't he? Now, you know, back there on my bookshelf, I've got the works of John Owen. It's 16 volumes long. And that doesn't even include the seven volumes that he took to do a commentary on the book of Hebrews. It's an extraordinary work great length and yet here is the most monumental announcement that we can imagine and look at how short it is and yet how packed with information it is he says in no uncertain terms though she is greatly troubled verse 30 the angel said to her do not be afraid mary for you have found favor with god again that's emphasized and behold you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Now, we already know that she's a virgin. She hasn't been with a man, and yet she's going to conceive in her womb. That's a tremendous amount of information for her to digest and for us to digest. But nevertheless, it will be a male child, a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. No question, not asking that it be done, but it's declared. She's instructed to call him Jesus, which, of course, as we've already said, means the Lord saves. He will be great. Not merely great in the eyes of men or great in the eyes of the Lord, but in and of himself, innate within his character, he will be great as God is great because he is God. 
Son of the Most High, declaration of deity. No one else can claim that. We can claim it by way of adoption. We've been adopted into the God's family whereby we're able to cry out to him, Abba, Father. But Jesus is a son by virtue of his eternal identity and will be identified as such. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will have that throne as an inheritance as well as by right and will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end tremendous amount of information now mary not out of unbelief but out of curiosity out of simple questioning she believes what the angel says that becomes clear but nevertheless how will this be it's a simple biological question for all of us and we all wonder and note how the angel answers her firmly and yet discreetly the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That is the extent of our knowledge of the way in which the virgin birth comes about. And brothers and sisters, we are told everything that we need to know. God did not have the scriptures written to satisfy all of the questions of unbelieving skeptics. The scriptures are written for his people that we may know these things are true, that while we cannot explain this in scientific language, again, to satisfy the curiosity of unbelieving skeptics, we nevertheless affirm that God brought forth his son sinlessly into the world, and yes, we believe it's important. I would never advocate or in any way endorse the statement that one pastor said before, stated before his presbytery when he was asked if he believed in the virgin birth and he said crassly well if there was a baby there had to be a man around somewhere that is blasphemous jesus came forth from the virgin mary conceived miraculously by the holy spirit do i understand that i don't understand how i'm in god's kingdom today Believe me, I was looking at myself in the mirror this morning and I was wondering, God, how can it be? When I think of who I am and what I would be apart from his grace, I can't even understand that little bit. I can't even understand when I see a little insect crawling across the floor. How is it that that thing is able to function and annoy me the way that it does as it does it? But all the legs are moving and all the body parts are there. And it's just an extraordinary thing. And to think that the same God who is holding together this vast universe that is so huge and incomprehensible, and yet at the same time he knows exactly what that little nearly microscopic bug is doing on my floor, I can't comprehend that. So why would I pretend to comprehend this miraculous event? I simply say praise to the Lord, the Almighty, who does all things well. Therefore, the Lord himself, said the Isaiah the prophet, will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which we know means God with us. What we see here is that the Holy Spirit's role in the incarnation is indicative of the child's identity. After all, he is God in the flesh, and so therefore God the Holy Spirit who was present at the creation, remember? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. The Spirit of God present at creation is here present for the incarnation. That means that the full power of God is unleashed. That means if you know Jesus, you're secure because the power of God has been at work to reveal this glorious knowledge to you, and he has worked salvation in you. Any time that we take on a task, we have to ask ourselves, do I have the ability to see it through? God is able to see things through because the child to be born will be called holy, the son of God. God's power is sufficient. As it says here, for nothing will be impossible with God. Jesus says elsewhere, with God all things are possible. And he also said, Abba, when praying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Now, we know, of course, 
that that by inference means that everything that is consistent with God's holy character, God cannot sin, God cannot do evil. We know that when it says all things are possible, it doesn't literally mean everything we can think of, but everything consistent with the character and the holiness of God is possible. Can the worst of sinners be saved? Absolutely. Can God keep that which we've committed unto him against that day? Absolutely. Can he complete the work that he has begun in you in Christ Jesus? Absolutely. And the response of faith. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And thus every true servant of the Lord says to him, a response of humility and a submission, let it be to me as you have said. Joseph also indicated faith when, as Matthew records, he woke from his sleep, having had revealed this truth, having had it revealed to him in his sleep. He woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Do you realize, by the way, that in Matthew, when we have essentially Joseph's side of the story, that nowhere do we have Joseph speaking? We don't have any quotation from Joseph at all in Matthew's gospel. But what we have is his example. He did as the Lord commanded. That's the essence of faith. It's not just in the talking, it's in the doing. And so saving faith is not merely a spoken faith. It is an actual exercise in which we repent of sins and trust in Jesus. It is a daily exercise in which we repent of sin and trust in Jesus. And so we read this with wonder. And in this Advent season, we give praise and thanks because, indeed, everything's in the name. The gospel itself is in the name of Jesus. And as Luke later on will tell us in chapter 19, which, Lord willing, we'll get to one of these days, Jesus will declare that the reason the Son of Man came was to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus saves. We're not ashamed to say it. Let the world make fun of us and deride us. Call us what it will, but we believe absolutely that this glorious, sinless Son of God, born of a virgin, laid in a manger, lived a sinless life, died an atoning death, to accomplish what no one else could. His birth is like no other because he is like no other. Bless his name, and we are all here today to worship him. May God give you grace to believe what he has revealed. Heavenly Father, grant to us, O Lord, we pray, an understanding that goes beyond the mere intellectual. Lord, we know from our Bibles that the devil believes everything that I've said about Jesus in these few moments together. And yet, there is not repentance and faith. So, Lord, grant that we may be more than that, that we may believe more than that, that not just with our minds, but with our hearts, with our lives, we might affirm and surrender to this glorious truth, to this one who came to seek out and to save even people like us. Thank you, Father, for the gospel, for our Lord Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. And so we come now to the table of our Lord Jesus, this being the first Lord's Day of the month. It is our custom to celebrate the supper of the Lord Jesus on this day. And I want to say to all of you gathered here, you may or may not be a Presbyterian today. It doesn't matter. This is not a Presbyterian table. This is the Lord's table. And that means anyone who by repentance and faith has a relationship with Christ and you've made a public declaration of that faith, you are welcome to come here. We know it's about more than us, right? I mean, this building's nearly full, but that's just a drop in the ocean in comparison to all the rest of the believers in the world, and we're a part of that great company. So I want to encourage you, if you have that saving relationship with Christ, invite you to this table today, but come repenting of sin, come acknowledging your need of the Savior. That's an ongoing thing that all of us need to do. 
There's a warning in Scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that talks about partaking of this supper in an unworthy manner. Partaking in a worthy manner means, as I've just said, you come repenting and trusting in Jesus. You're not trying to redefine your sin. You're not trying to cover it up or to manage it. But daily, you're repenting of it. We haven't achieved perfection yet. Think you have? I need to talk with you after the service. <laughs> no, perfection lies in the person of Jesus, and so we come to this table because we recognize our need to trust in Him. So I encourage you to come in that way. For on the night in which He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, "This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me." And in the same manner, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. These are very ordinary elements. We don't believe that they're transformed into anything other than what they are. But they represent to us the extraordinary, even the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. And so, through this simple act of worship, by partaking of the bread and drinking of the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, and we experience his grace in the here and now. Let's bow together and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread, and we thank you for the cup, and we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us, we pray, as we partake of this meal together, that as we join together with all of those who believe, who in like manner eat bread and drink the cup in demonstration of our faith in Christ. That in this, O oh God, we may demonstrate that unity for which the Lord Jesus prayed when he asked that we might be one even as he is one with you. And so bless these elements that are most ordinary to an extraordinary use as we partake of them by faith, giving you thanks in Jesus' name. I'll ask the elders to come and will serve. These trays will be passed. Feel free to partake. Hold the elements until everyone is served, and then we'll take together. But I want to remind you, as the Lord Jesus prayed and gave thanks, we just having done that in his name, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you.
Does anyone need to be served that wasn't served? Anyone at all? In remembrance of him. Last week I've been thinking about something, meditating on something that I think God has put it in my head, and that is you realize that, that our Lord Jesus Christ was the only person in history who was not so much born as he was given. He was older than his parents. Pastor told us today, Jesus is the eternal Son of God, older than his parents. And he, and he was born, yes, indeed, he was born. But more than that, he was given to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Paul tells us in Romans, he who did not spare his own Son, but who delivered him up for us all. That word deliver in the original language is an intensification of the word gave. Our Lord Jesus was given to us. And then our Lord Jesus gave himself to us. The scriptures tell us that uh, Jesus gave himself as a ransom for many. And today, if you name the name of Christ, our Lord Jesus gave himself for you. And then, on the night of his betrayal, as Pastor Patrick has shared with us, our Lord Jesus took bread and broke it. And what did he do with that bread? He gave it to his disciples. And in his name, I give this to you. Our Lord Jesus Christ, given to you, given to for you, given to us for our redemption. In the same fashion, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you show forth my death until I come again. So as, as the elements are passed, as the elders pass the elements, and as you hold that in your hand, waiting for all of us to be able to partake together, we'll be thinking about the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ gave himself for you and for me.
Lord Jesus, the eternal Son of God, thank you for entering into the world you created, which we broke. And for our brokenness, you died. And now, God, to each of us who humbles ourselves before you, may it be to us according to your word. Drink all of you of it. The Bible says that when they had sung a hymn, they departed. We're going to conclude by singing together. Go tell it on the mountain. in southwest Florida, you can do it from a bridge or the top of a condo, but we proclaim the Lord, shout it from the mountaintop. I'd like to ask elders to come forward and perhaps Rachel and others to come stand with me up here. If you have anything that you would like to pray about uh, following the benediction, please come up. We'll pray with you. In the meantime, may the Lord bless you as you go your way. What a joy it has been to worship with each of you. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up unto you his countenance and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. And everyone said together, amen.